So uh, we will just give everybody two minutes uh, to arrive. Then I think we can start. I would like to welcome you all, each and every one. We are more than 350 people registered for this event. It is quite overwhelming. We welcome each one of you. We don't think any of us have the feeling that we are that many together, but um, we hope you will all get a very good day, even if you uh, is just one in the multitude uh, in front of the screen. I'd like to share with you before we start just a few words uh, about uh, play the game. A very short introduction for those of you who may not uh, know our organization. Um, I have a little slide here. Uh, basically, Play the Game has for many years uh, called ourselves Home for the Homeless Questions in Sport. It's a very good uh, name to have. You can argue that many of the questions that we have debated over the years are fortunately not homeless uh, any longer, but new homeless questions uh, keep appearing. Our goal is to strengthen the ethical foundation of sport and promote democracy, transparency and freedom of expression. And we have done so, among other things, uh, through 11 conferences since 1997. And the next one, which marks our 25th uh, anniversary, is in Odense in Denmark in uh, June 2022. And I will repeat that later, but you can note the dates, 27 to 30 June 2022. Mainly we work in informal networks where we include journalists, researchers, sports officials, athlete representatives, um, anti-doping uh, activists, employees, government officials, etc. At our conferences, many issues have been raised for the first time thanks to our very courageous speakers, experts, whistleblowers, investigative journalists, like the use of EPO, match fixing, uh, illegal doping trade, fever corruption, systemic doping, and many other issues. 
Uh, we have a website, uh, playthegame.org. We have a free newsletter that you can also subscribe to if you're not already doing so. Uh, we do work in informal and formal networking, and we carry out research projects. As, and of course, it's a research project we will speak about today. Formally speaking, uh, we are part of the Danish Institute for Sports Studies. That is an independent research uh, unit uh, under the umbrella of the Ministry of Culture, but we are operating at arm's length and we do not take any instructions about our content uh, from the Ministry. Now, I would also like to say, how did we get this far? Today, of course, we are extremely happy and proud that we can present a second round of NSGO results. It's, uh, it's really a great uh, achievement for us, and it has been a long way coming. It actually started some 10 years ago when uh, we were invited to a European Commission, to the sports unit of the European Commission, they had an idea that it would be interesting to have some research into sports governance, and they said that they found we should apply and gather an alliance of experts. And so we did, and we got a grant, and we started what we call the Action for Good Governance in International Sports Organizations. When we had our first meeting there, everybody around the table said, we have had enough guidelines for good governance. Everybody knows what it's about. What we need is to have a tool and a benchmarking tool, and we started developing that. We could not, the, the, the project was not uh, long enough to completely finalize the tool, but we made a pilot version. And in 2015, Play the Game uh, reserved its own resources uh, to cooperate with Arnold Gerard from KU Leuven, who developed then the Sports Governance Observer 2015 tool. That was the first time we actually applied the tool on 35 international Olympic federations. They came up quite poorly, came out quite poorly, I have to say. And I think this survey actually uh, showed uh, the Olympic world that there was an outside interest and that they had to do something about their governance themselves. We then started asking ourselves, where does the bad governance at the international level come from? And the obvious question was, it did not come from above. It came from below, from the national federations, and we took an interest in benchmarking national sports uh, organizations. So we then developed uh, in a research project also with uh, universities and sports organizations from 10 countries, nine European countries, Brazil, we actually developed the National Sports Governance Observer. And the first report where we benchmarked these 10 countries was in 2018, uh, almost exactly today, it is uh, uh, 10 years ago, sorry, uh, three years ago. We wanted to follow up a little more quickly, but as you know, uh, something has happened uh, in the past years that has delayed many things, uh, but now we have the National Sports Governance Observer uh, to the second round of research where uh, researchers in 15 countries supervised by uh, Sandy Adam um, have actually benchmarked a number of federations nationally. I'm not going deeper into the methodology, but uh, I would just thank all the researchers for hanging on in spite of the COVID crisis. Some have ha had serious delays and could not complete it, but, but uh, definitely we have a good group of countries now. I'd like to say just a few words about what we actually benchmark. We benchmark one side of the truth. We benchmark rules, procedures, regulations. We do not benchmark the reality. That is more of a journalistic task or a political task. That is a very, very complex reality that we cannot grasp with our benchmarking instruments. Nevertheless, we think it's justifiable to benchmark rules, regulations and procedures, because if we don't have them, in, have them in the organizations, these organizations are easily manipulated uh, in the hands of those who want to seize power and use sport for their own benefits. 
Uh, what we used to say is that good governance does not solve all the problems, but without good governance, no problem will be solved. There is another risk in this discussion that we overfocus on the statistics, graphs, numbers, scores, uh, figures. Uh, measuring sports governance is not an exact science. It is, there are a lot of parameters that are subject to discussion and should be. And the most important we have learned from this process is that having these numbers and graphs and statistics actually helps the discussion and motivates, motivates the discussion and in some uh, occasions also inspires real change. Last but not least, a few housekeeping remarks. We are really grateful that you are so many, but we're also a bit overwhelmed, sometimes even a bit terrified. More than 350 registrations is really way beyond what we had imagined. Um, we hope you will forgive us that we don't have, uh, we don't display a very solid knowledge about how these big online events play out. Uh, we thank you for being part of this experiment and hope it will not be uh, uh, too inconvenient for you. The meeting is recorded, so if you don't want to be on camera, please turn off your camera. We have also taken a measure that is very much contrary to the spirit of play the game. We have actually deactivated everybody's microphones, uh, except those who have done the research over the past years and those who are speakers in this event. And may I say to those who speak, please bear in mind to speak slowly. We uh, are uh, recording and we are listening under very different circumstances technically, and we also speak many variations of English, so please speak slowly and clearly. Having deactivated your microphone does not mean that you are not allowed to express yourselves, but you should use the chat function. Um, our editor, Kirsten Spa, will study the chat function, and when it, we have questions and answers, she will be the one um, with an overview over the questions, and she might edit some of the questions into one. Uh, Kirsten, will you let yourself, will you make yourself known? I will make myself known. I'm here. Hello, okay. everyone. Great. Kirsten is our uh, editor uh, of Play the Game. With these uh, introductory remarks, I uh, look forward to uh, hearing what Sandy Adam uh, will present. Sandy Adam is a PhD candidate at uh, Leipzig University. He has been uh, with us uh, for uh, almost two years. We have uh, had a very, very good cooperation a distant cooperation uh, due to the pandemic, but a very fruitful cooperation. Sandy has meticulously gone through all the data from the 15 countries, asked difficult questions to the researchers. He may not be that popular among them, but uh, this is a way uh, that we try to ensure a harmonized standard and quality of the research. Also, I should thank Christina Fries Johansen who was formerly with us and who has uh, undertaken the review of three of the 15 countries. But now I will uh, leave the floor to you, Sandy. Uh, good luck. Thank you, Jens. I, I, hope, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, that's great news. Um, as Jens has said, you know, the challenges are definitely also in staging these formats. Meanwhile, like being all from distance and coming together. So this is not only for our guests here, and I'm also very overwhelmed to understand that we are almost 350 people, um, but also a bit of a challenge for us to, to stage this event. Um, I will share my screen now. Um, I hope that that everybody will be able to see the screen can can we see that i think it's um it looks good right yeah okay um yes so jens again thank you for the for the invitation uh, to to come here also to present uh, the main findings and uh, this is actually what i'm 
uh, going to do in the next uh, 15 minutes. Um, so we are asking ourselves uh, where is sports governance today and uh, and this will be answered hopefully with a short overview on the main results of the NSG02 uh, benchmarking. As I said or as Jens has said, uh, my name is Sandy Adam. I'm a, a PhD candidate at a Leipzig University and have been with Play the Game for roughly two years um, as a governance researcher or senior analyst and uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to speak to you um, in this overview presentation. Um, this is a short uh, overview of the contents. I think I don't need to spend so, so much time on this um, and uh, would rather uh, shortly give a project overview and uh, also the partners. Uh, uh, so the first round of NSGO uh, benchmarking has taken place uh, three years ago. So it was 10 countries uh, that participated there, mostly from Europe uh, and, and Brazil. Uh, but now in the second round, which actually started also already a few years ago and has finished this year, we uh, have 15 countries um, and it's not only uh, Europe. So we are basically on, on, 50, uh, on four continents. So Europe, Asia and North and South America. And uh, this is just a, a short overview. So we, we have Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, where uh, Marko Begovic uh, was in charge of the research. Um, we have Bulgaria, which has been um, conducted by uh, Petja Kosova. Uh, we have Canada uh, by Ryan Gauthier. And we have uh, Colombia as well uh, with Ana Maria Arias. Um, we have Georgia on board with Anatoly Koripanov. Um, we have, we have Iceland here, uh, along with uh, Colombia, will also present later some findings, uh, which is Gartha and um, Augustin and uh, Jon Reni Renison. We have India on board with uh, De Lindo, um, Indonesia, also a presentation later with Renata uh, Putri and um, Amal Ganesha. Um, we have uh, Lithuania with Irina Valentine, um, Portugal, Luis Haas, uh, we have Serbia, this is Marco Begovic again, uh, Slovenia with Rosle Brezel, um, Spain, Alberto Carrillo San Pedro, um, Ukraine, we'll have a presentation later as well with uh, Olya Borisova and the United States with Spencer Harris. So this just should give a bit of credit to all the researchers, they have done a great work and I have uh, been yeah, discussing with them back and forth uh, the results and the reports and this is now our final um, yeah our final product uh, first of all uh, a, a bit of an overview or short uh, definition of some concepts um, our national sports governance observer is a tool which measures governance in four dimensions um, the first dimension is transparency and uh, this refers to the reporting of the organization's um, own internal workings uh, and makes it possible also for, for others to, to see what is going on within the organization. Um, the second dimension, democratic processes or democracy, uh, which refers to uh, free, fair and competitive elections. Uh, and also uh, it looks at making sure that all uh, relevant stakeholders in, uh, are, are involved or can participate in decision making processes. The third dimension, it is accountability or in, in the terms of the NSGO uh, observer, it is called internal accountability and control. And here we mainly talk about checks and balances, um, separation of power, um, so that we can see that, um, yeah, uh, there's a solid governance uh, structure. And the fourth dimension, the societal responsibility, which looks at actually the organization's impact that it can have, hopefully positively, uh, on the internal and external environment. Altogether, um, the National Sports Governance Observer uh, covers 46 principles um, and 274 indicators. Um, this is only a short overview um, on the concept, and now I would like to already uh, switch to the main results. Um, I could present many, many, many results because you can imagine that a database with uh, 15 countries and eight federations on average. So it's more than 100 federations that we that we have looked at and uh, with 274 indicators. Uh, it's a very, very large database. So um, I try to keep it very simple with the domain results also to yeah, to to have the overview as we need it. Um, here um, are our main uh, findings. These are the overall scores uh, for all countries. So um, the overall score on all the four principles, uh, sorry, all the four dimensions is 40%. Uh, 
um, or a so-called moderate score. That means it's not overly um, high in terms of uh, when you look at that 100 is the maximum. Uh, it also reflects the, the scores that we calculated for the first round of the NSGO uh, benchmarking uh, three years ago, but it was a bit higher three years ago with 47%. Um, when we look at the uh, individual dimensions, uh, we can see that transparency uh, is highest, 48%, also reflecting the 2018 results, although uh, it was um, it were higher results. Uh, it was, um, I think, at 51%. Uh, we have uh, the democratic process that I mentioned with uh, 41%, um, also in line with the results three years ago, but again, slightly lower scores. Um, the same applies to internal accountability and control, which is second here, 44%, slightly lower than 2018. Um, and also, um, or let's say with a bit of uh, lagging behind, is the societal responsibility dimension, 27%, which was also the lowest dimension uh, three years ago. But this time, actually, the, the percentage spread is, is much higher. So it's 11 points, percentage points uh, lower than three years ago. So what we can see already from an overall perspective, so the, governments is, the governance of these uh, 15 countries is uh, at the lower end of the moderate corridor, so to speak. So we are uh, on the verge of actually weak governance uh, uh, scores for uh, these 15 countries and the federations therein. Um, if you look excuse at me? the countries. Sandy, yes. Excuse me. There are people yes. who say that there was a picture of uh, me disturbing the slides, if you can remove it. Um, when you come. Uh, you can start window sharing again, but there was somebody uh, complaining uh, that uh, there was a little uh, window that was sh overshadowing your slides. Okay. Not much. It's better now. Are we? Are we? Are you seeing it now again? The slides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. So. You, and yeah. Okay. Thank you for this. Um, for this notice, I didn't. I didn't see this actually. <laughs> okay, um, so we have we have talked about uh, the main the main uh, scores for for all uh, dimensions, and here we have this particular look at the countries. Um, there is um, there is some variation uh, in there. So we have uh, uh, Serbia with 59% being the top country, so to say. Um, the US following in second position with 53% uh, fulfillment, and Bosnia and Herzegovina with 58%. Um, I have used here the pluses and, and minuses only just to actually show that uh, these are the, the best three results and, uh, and the poorest, uh, if you want to say, results. But overall, we couldn't really say that even um, and a 59% for Serbia, that is, these are necessarily really good results. Uh, but we can discuss this later on. Um, Indonesia, 28%, uh, India, 27%. And Georgia, 21% being at the, at the lower end of our uh, scoring here. If you look then at, at the four dimensions, um, this is, is a country overview for the first uh, dimension, the transparency uh, dimension. Uh, Serbia, 66%, Iceland, 64%, and uh, Lithuania and the US um, actually sharing the third uh, place with 58%. Uh, again, um, the lowest uh, scores for the transparency dimension have been found for India, 38%, uh, Georgia, uh, 22 uh, and Indonesia uh, with uh, 17%. And uh, uh, the principles, so uh, for the transparency dimension, we can see here we have seven uh, principles out of the 46 and uh, we have a nice traffic light, light system um, that also um, is part of the report that will be published uh, today or will be released with our webinar. So um, it's actually quite nice to see the countries and, and their uh, fulfillment uh, on the principles. So for, for uh, transparency, we can say that uh, the first principle, uh, which refers to uh, the publication of legal and policy documents, um, is uh, scoring uh, the best or achieving the, the best results, altogether 73%. So um, this refers, for example, to the publication of the statutes um, of internal regulations um, of uh, annual reports uh, and also, uh, for example, multi-annual policy plans or uh, the sporting rules of the, of the relevant sport. So we can say that actually the federations here are quite uh, transparent, if, if you want to say this. 
Um, but when we look at, at the other uh, six uh, principles, uh, we see um, uh, lower achievements uh, in particular uh, when it comes to uh, information about board members. So uh, especially uh, the biographical information, uh, the uh, duration of their of their term uh, and also uh, basically other positions uh, on other sports organizations board. For example, we almost have we have very low information on this. Uh, what what uh, federations usually do is that they list their board members so you can get an understanding who actually presides over uh, the sports federation. But additional information are quite are quite scarce. And the same is true uh, with uh, only 25 percent achievement for the remuneration. Uh, we will see uh, that a few uh, federations have said actually that board members are not remunerated, uh, so they cannot actually uh, publish remuneration uh, uh, reports. Uh, so this is also an, an important point if we if we look at uh, interpreting our results is that um, looking over the, the 15 countries on four continents that are of course different cultural and uh, also uh, so social backgrounds that uh, that might also have differences here. But on general uh, or generally speaking, um, we have a rather low achievement here when it comes to remuneration reporting. The second um, dimension, the democratic processes. Again, first uh, I start with a short country overview. Um, we see um, that scores on, on average are slightly lower uh, than in transparency with the US. Uh, also again among the top um, uh, three countries, 57%. Um, Lithuania quite strong in, in, in that sense um, in the interpretation of moderate scores a second a second position with 53 percent and Colombia uh, having 50 percent achievement and on the other end of the spectrum um, we see Ukraine 34 um, percent Indonesia 29 and Slovenia also 29 percent uh, having uh, lower average achievements here again looking at uh, some of the principles uh, we can see that uh, there are th two principles here that achieve, uh, like let's say, a dark green light, which uh, actually refers to to a very good achievement, um, which is, uh, for example, principle eight, uh, which uh, refers to the elections of board members. This mainly um, uh, refers to a clear uh, procedures, clear regulations uh, of how board members are elected or appointed and reappointed. Um, so usually the federations uh, in their statutes uh, define uh, very clear uh, rules on how that how that works and the score here uh, was uh, 82 uh, percent and the other um, very good achievement uh, was uh, for the member representation uh, principle 13. Um, this refers to regulations uh, whereby for example it is uh, regulated that all affiliated member organizations are actually having a say or can have a say by participating in the general assembly and that uh, usually the general assembly also meets uh, once a year which is actually the case in almost all federations there's a few exceptions where for example the um, general assembly meets uh, only every two years for example um, what is on the other end of the spectrum? Um, we, we, we can we can clearly say that uh, we, when we look at the representation of uh, relevant stakeholder groups, um, so it's not necessarily only the, the member federations uh, that that are referred to, but specific uh, stakeholder groups such as athletes, for example, or coaches, uh, referees, uh, volunteers, and employees. Uh, we see a differentiated picture. Uh, specifically, uh, volunteers' participation is, has been very low, with 7% achievement only. And also, when we talk about uh, athlete activism or the um, yeah, possibilities for athletes to, to, to influence processes that actually affect them as, as one of the most important stakeholder groups in, in sports, it's only 31%. So there is there's much room for improvement there. And the same, uh, the same if, we, if we look at diversity or representation of, of for example, women uh, in, in sports organizations, then we also see um, a, a much room for improvement uh, because um, gender equality policy seems to be quite uh, rare uh, to say uh, all, all over the 15 countries. Uh, the third dimension, internal accountability and control. Um, again, uh, the country overview first, uh, Serbia quite strong uh, with 74% followed by Bosnia and Herzegovina and the US. Um, so this is also, you can, we can see that uh, the top uh, three countries perform um, mostly also better uh, over the uh, four dimensions. 
And on the uh, uh, end of the spectrum, Slovenia 31%, uh, India 29%, and, and Georgia uh, 14%. Again, a, a bit of a, a snapshot about some principles. Um, we see here that there is no single uh, principle uh, that achieves a good, uh, sorry, very good results like the dark green we had at least in the two dimensions before. Best results uh, were achieved for principle 24, which refers to a clear governance structure. Uh, so, for example, here it is uh, regulated whether, uh, for example, the board is supervised uh, or whether management is, for example, supervised, whether there are a standing and permitted permanent committees uh, that will uh, yeah, supervise the board's um, the board's actions. And then what's also positive because it is um, related or I've referred to a, a, an important governance function also in the literature is uh, the um, implementation of audit committees or financial committees, um, uh, principle 26. We have a bit of uh, some, uh, some, some issues, um, for example, relate to principle 31. When it comes to conflicts of interest procedures, um, there is uh, definitely some, some room for improvement with only 30% uh, fulfillment. Um, that means that uh, there is no clear policies or no clear um, uh, yeah, procedures how a conflict of interest that could occur between different stakeholders uh, are yeah, regulated or solved uh, in cases of these uh, in cases these conflicts arise. Um, yeah, moving uh, to the fourth dimension, also looking a bit at the time. Um, fourth dimension, as I have said, uh, clearly uh, the lowest dimension, societal responsibility, with uh, altogether 27%. Uh, again, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the best uh, performing countries, um, but with a, a discount, if you want to say, a remarkable discount uh, compared to the other uh, dimensions, 48%, 38 and 37 and uh, Iceland, uh, 18%, Georgia, 12 and India, 7% uh, achieve considerably lower scores on this societal responsibility dimension. Um, when we look at uh, at our traffic light system, we can see that it's clearly more more red than uh, on the other um, um, slides that have been presented before. We we can now say that there's not even one uh, good achievement. So our light green, um, our light green uh, traffic lights. So we we have actually more or less weak or even not fulfilled indicators. So orange and and red. What is uh, acceptable somehow is that uh, all or most, not all, but most of the federations apply some sort of anti-doping policies or take or take actions against um, against uh, yeah doping um, practices in sport, which is not that surprising in a sense because um, yes the federations need to follow the WADA code and then also the sport for all uh, principle is uh, kind of acceptable here, but we we can see. Um, on average, we, we have red um, lights going on for, for three principles. Again, the gender equality uh, um, policy, which is also reflected in our democratic, uh, trans, uh, democratic processes dimension. There's hardly a gender equality policies available. Uh, it's only, um, I think, 11%, uh, which is very low, the same lows or the lowest scores overall on the principles is for environmental sustainability, which also should give us uh, of course, alarming signals, especially um, when we look at the wider implications that now uh, sustainable um, environmental sustainability has for for society. So a lot to do, uh, especially here, and that's why uh, we have also framed it uh, for our uh, panel discussion that we, we say actually how how socially responsible, for example, could or should uh, uh, national sports federations be. So this brings me to my to my last. Uh, uh, short um, policy implications that I present here from the from the findings. Um, I have, uh, for example, when it comes to transparency, uh, we can ask the questions. Uh, the question whether transparency is more actually than just uh, putting statutes and sports rules on the website. Um, although this is quite has been quite fulfilled quite well, we can see still some let's say websites uh, of uh, sports federations that are not really modern that are maybe difficult to use. So we we suggest that modern and efficient communication should be something uh, federations should uh, invest money in, and it's not only about uh, the communication of, uh, of sports uh, achievements or so, but it's more also about social and uh, and the economic aspects. 
Um, disclosure of annual reports and financial information. I have uh, already highlighted that uh, remuneration reports, for example, is something that is uh, hardly to be found, uh, but also here um, um, showing showing annual reports and financial information allows stakeholders uh, yeah, to, to, to see how the organization actually uses the funds that they provide uh, or whether the organization actually takes action that develops the sport. Democratic processes, some implications here. Um, the main suggestion or the main implication is actually that more stakeholder participation is needed um, in terms of athletes, in terms of um, volunteers. I have mentioned this. It's particularly interesting that some federations, for example, highlighted that um, it is sometimes difficult to find actually people who, who, who can success or sorry succeed um, um, board members, for example. So if we if you find a policy to involve those who are committed to the sports, being the athletes, coaches, referees, and uh, and volunteers, that can maybe help actually also recruit board members for the future. Um, I said that balanced and differentiated composition of the board is needed. Um, so that, that refers to the qualifications of board members uh, and also of uh, diversity and the nomination committees actually uh, are, are, are not to, a, to a, a good extent actually implemented. Uh, if they are implemented, then they are mostly on an ad hoc basis just to oversee the election process. But these, uh, these committees can take more action actually identifying candidates for board positions. Uh, third, accountability and control. The main finding here is actually to identify and regulate conflicts of interest because they can really hamper um, the good governance of, of sports organization, of, of sport organizations, implement stronger financial controls, and uh, also strategic planning is, is something that that sometimes part of uh, sometimes part of the governance system, uh, because most federations rely on on, on government budgets, um, which makes them difficult or it makes it difficult for them actually to do a, a strategic planning, but but nevertheless. Uh, financial planning, strategic planning is, is something that is always future oriented and should not be only uh, related to, to the, uh, let's say, relationship to the government or any other donors. Um, last but not least, um, and most, most importantly uh, from the findings, our societal responsibility uh, dimension is we are asking the questions whether sports federations should actually take care beyond the sports. So that's maybe an interesting discussion point for later. Um, and uh, there's, there's, there's uh, yeah, room for action or room for improvement almost all of all dimensions. Uh, strikingly, environmental sustainability, we, we all the time like here, uh, plans for federations, for example, to stage winter sports events uh, somewhere in, in, in Dubai or wherever. So we need to understand like, uh, or the sports federation need to understand how they can actually reduce the carbon footprint, which is a, a, a more societal um, a goal for, for everybody. Um, dual careers um, and also then those policies related to sexual harassment and, and anti-discrimination uh, shows quite some policy improvements that need to be there. Now, um, uh, I thank you very much for, for listening to me. Um, sorry for the short technical issues. But many thanks, and uh, I will head over now, I think, to, to Stanis, uh, who will chair the session for our um, guests from the partnering countries. Many thanks. Yes, thank you very much, Sandy, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Stanis Selspo from Play the Game. I'm a senior analyst and uh, head of conference. and. Uh, as Sandy said, I will be sharing uh, this session where we will have a Twitter table and a Q&A on some of the new uh, results of this round of the NSGO research. We will hear about uh, some of the findings from Colombia, Iceland, Indonesia and Ukraine. And the session will go on for about 45 minutes. So I will kindly remind uh, every speaker to keep uh, the presentation relatively short maybe sandy and jens should have had that instruction as well they have been taking some of your time but nevertheless uh, please try to keep it short i i believe you've been given around uh, seven minutes for each presentation um, afterwards we will have a, a short round of uh, questions and regarding questions please uh, use the chat function and my colleague kirsten spa will keep an eye on them after the Q&A, uh, the webinar will uh, have a short break for uh, about 10 minutes. But uh, let's get uh, into the research and the new NSGO results. We will start out with uh, Colombia 
And uh, I now have the pleasure to give the word to Catalina Melendro, uh, a member of the Colombian National Olympic Academy and a PhD candidate at Canterbury Christchurch University. Please, Catalina. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be today with you. And good morning from Colombia and good afternoon for most of you who are in Europe today. Um, I will try first to share my screening. Please let me know once you are able to watch it. I believe she dropped out. Can you out. see it now? Now we can still hear you, but we, we can see it. Maybe I, I, I can try to share it. Well, if you're able, I sent it to Jens a few minutes yeah. ago. Yes. I'm, I'm trying to share, but yeah. So I will stop trying and then you are able to, to share it. Yeah, Maybe it, it would be easier. I'll try. Thank you very much. Great, there it is. Uh, well, I will try my best for not running out of this seven minutes time, which is a little bit short, but we are going to try to, to go as deep as possible in those time. So firstly, I wanted to share that this report was built as an interinstitutional alliance with researchers from the three Colombian universities, the Colombian National Olympic Committee and the Colombian Sport Ministry. Data gathering took place from January to August 2019. And during this data collection phase, the research team was composed of eight head researchers and six student researchers. Uh, next one, please. Uh, for this report, the sample taken for the study is balanced, reporting different type of organization according to the NSGO methodology. Uh, indeed, the sample includes two large size organization, namely the Colombian Olympic Committee and the Colombian Football Federation, two medium-sized federations, Colombian Cycling Federation and Colombian Tennis Federation, and four small-sized federations, Colombian Athletics, Colombian Handball, Colombian Fencing, and Colombian Swimming Federation. Next one, please. Uh, the average NSGO index of the eight Colombian national sport organization was 45%, which constitutes a moderate score according to the scale of the project. Transparency Dimension scored the highest average result in the same relation as Sandy present with the, uh, with the other uh, countries. Democratic Processes and Internal Accountability Dimension scored 50 and 48% respectively. And Social Responsibility Dimension scored the lowest average with 27%. It was in this specific dimension that all national federations obtained its weakest ratings. Please, next one. Uh, also, while analyzing the NSGO scoring labels distribution result, it was found that almost 40% of the overall indicators were not fulfilled by the different sport organization analyzed. This illustrates and emphasizes the significant room for the governance improvement within the Colombian sport system. Next, please. Finally, while going into the detail of each principal analysis, it was interesting to note only two principles scored very good average score, while eight principles scored less than 20% average score, which makes them to fit into the not fulfilled category. Additionally, after further analysis, it was found most of good and very good results are related to regulatory measures imposed by the Colombian national sports system, which illustrates the effect of legal provisions contained in Decree 1085 of 2015 and Decree 1228 of 1995, commonly known as the Colombian sport law. Meanwhile, the lowest results are found within the fourth dimension, which again, I, I said, is the one directly related to sport organization positive effect on internal and external stakeholders and society at large and therefore can be related to sport olympic organizations to be value-based organizations 
this is mentioned because of the title of this conference in specific, which I just realized that it is the same pattern from the other federations for the other countries. But here in Colombia, we found it very interesting as well. In specific, much of the weakest results are directly connected with the lack of governance and management consulting services for national sport federations to offer to its members. Also, the lack of implementation of social responsibility actions directed to structure sport-related health risk policy mitigations, the lack of contact points specifically working on sexual harassment, social inclusion, discrimination, gender equality, match fixing, and environmental sustainability matters. Um, these findings show again the necessity for Colombian national sport organization to actively work in addressing its sport integrity duty of non-discrimination, gender equality, and environmental sustainability, and the need to advance from good governance, institutional discourses, to real implementation and enforcement strategies. In specific, for the transparency dimensions, the research team conclude different strategic improvement actions should be established, regarding first to the design and publication of the multi-year reports, Similarly, improving the accessibility and visibility of information related to the executive committee meetings, minutes, annual ma management report, and management-related documents that should be documented in the organization websites. Secondly, for the democratic process dimension, several improvement actions frame in the general lack of athletes, referees, coaches, and volunteers participation and national federations, internal bodies were found which again shows the need of having a more balanced representation within sport governance organizations to be taken into account. In relation to the third dimension, Colombian National Sport Federation and the Colombian National Olympic Committee should direct efforts to establish improvement actions based on internal accountability best practices and self-evaluation processes and specific conflict of interest regulatory procedures. Finally, for the fourth and weakest dimension, governance improvement plan has to be structured in a more solid, clear, democratic, inclusive and honest way in order to truly have Colombian sport entities promoting sport Olympic values within Colombian society at large. Well, this is just a short overview of the Colombian report and I will invite you as well to read it once it's published and thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Catalina. We will um, now go on to Iceland and uh, I can welcome uh, Gata Oli Agusson and John Rainier Reinison. They are both from uh, Molde University, so uh, please, uh, the screen is yours. Yep, hi, thanks for having us. Like I said, we're going to go shortly over our results for Iceland. Uh, can you see our screen? Our presentation? We can see you, but uh, not the presentation. We don't. Uh, sorry. There it is. Perfect. OK, thank you. Like I said, I'm Carla and this is Jon, and we were the lead researchers for the country report on Iceland. So we're going to go shortly over our main findings and key results. Um, uh, in our research, we had six small federations and two medium sized federations. Uh, and the key results are that the average NSGO index score for Iceland sport federations is 37%, which is considered weak. Um, the highest average dimension score was to transparency with 64%, which is considered good. Um, the dem democracy dimension 35% and accountability was 32%, which is both labeled weak. Um, and the lowest ranked dimension is societal responsibility with 18% and that is considered not fulfilled. Um, uh, regarding transparency, it's by far the best one for the Icelandic sport organizations. Uh, with most of the organizations being very good in terms of publishing statutes, internal regulations, and organization charts. 
the democratic processes is the second strongest dimensions with the one principle standing out regarding board members being democratically reappointed according to clear procedures where the average score was 88 percent or very good uh, internal accountability um, no principal within this dimension achieves an average score of good or very good, or the average was close to good at 58%, but still ranked as moderate. And societal responsibility, uh, the lowest of all dimensions, uh, which implies that little is done when it comes to matters such as gender equality, sexual harassment or discriminations, and objectives on how to tackle some pressing social matters. Um, However, it was noted that multiple federations, when asked in interviews when we met them, uh, that measures or, or that they had the interest or implemented guidelines on drug use or harassment. Uh, and like I said, many of them said in interviews that they were under the NOC and followed their implementations, but they rarely mentioned it in their reports or on their websites. Similar to the results of the other countries in the NSGO database, Iceland scored highest in transparency, which was close to the average score of the other previously surveyed European countries and Brazil at 65%. However, Iceland scored considerably worse in other dimensions compared to the average scores of the previous NSGO database with democracy at 35% compared to 44, accountability at 32% compared to 51, and societal responsibility at 18% compared to 38%. Iceland scores in these categories only reached a level of weak or not fulfilled. Regarding valid reasons for some of the Icelandic federations score deficiencies, many of the federation's representatives mentioned the difficulties of operating in a country with such a small population, one of which is the difficulty to recruit human resources to fill the many volunteer positions Hence, some federations deciding not to have a term limit for board members as they cannot afford to lose them and new ones are difficult to recruit. Being a small nation could easily be a strength when developing good governance practices and Iceland certainly has an opportunity to re-evaluate re their governance protocols. Icelandic federations are vulnerable due to their size, lack of skills, lack of resources or funding and blurred lines of good governance practices. Icelandic federations have an overall low score as they do not have various practices in place and there is a need to address these issues. As interviews with the federation's representatives revealed, much is being implemented. However, it is not mentioned in the statutes or internal regulations. Many federations claim to have unwritten rules that they use in day-to-day -day operations. This shows that there is a clear need to document unwritten rules or rule of thumb that are being used to govern the federations and to make them an official part of the rules and regulation. There is a need for more specific policies with clear objectives and actions. Yeah, as you say, there may be some reasons for why the Icelandic federations find it difficult to employ better practices. Uh, it is not that they are unwilling to comply, uh, rather they find it appropriate to operate in a way that they feel is more suitable for their setting. And uh, like we said, there is a lack of funding that causes federations to implement only the most basic functions for their everyday operations. But there's no doubt that being a small nation is not an excuse for not having adequate good governance protocols and Iceland should be able to improve only with some institutional support and guidance. Uh, and lastly, it's worth a mention to say that part of our master thesis, we finished benchmarking the rest of the federations in Iceland. So we have data for all 34 federations in Iceland, including the NOC. And we have had meetings with the Ministry of Education, Science and Sport and the NOC, and they have all expressed interest in using these results and creating some framework that could help federations in Iceland improve their good governance standards. Yeah, and uh, just to wrap it up, like Jens said in the beginning of this uh, webinar, we're not benchmarking reality, and the reality is that Iceland has uh, a huge opportunity to uh, 
do some minor changes to score significantly better with this uh, benchmarking tool. Thank you for your time. Yeah, those, this was a short intention of our results. Thank you. And thank you very much. And uh, we will now go from Iceland and all the way to uh, Indonesia. And it, must, it is my pleasure to welcome Renata Putri, uh, Research Associate at Ghana Sport Institute, who will uh, tell some of the results from Indonesia in the NSGO project. Renata, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So let me see if I have the same problem here. Oh. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Because I now cannot see the presentation. I mean, cannot see. Yes, we are sharing. Thank you. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Let me try. All right. Now, um, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity. So I'm here speaking on behalf of Ghana Sport Institute. So my name is Renata Putri. I'm the lead researcher for this project, and then I would like to invite everyone here to say hello to my director, Amal Ganesha. He's around here too. And then uh, let's just jump right in. So the re the relation in the project, so the, the data collected from January to July 2020. So I would like to actually give a disclaimer that a lot of things have changed to, during the time from 2020 to 2021. Okay, so I contacted with the head of organization affairs and head of legal affairs from Perbasi. They are really cooperative. They are really eager to ensure the accurate assessment motivated to improve governance. Uh, same case with the Swimming Federation and the NOC. They are really cooperative, uh, especially with the the, the NOC. They are really concerned with the outcome because uh, I believe the results can be valuable for for their their governance, but um, this is not the case for the sports committee, CONI, the football association, and the um, tennis association. So I actually already get the contact. Uh, we arranged some meetings, but they didn't come. Uh, and then the athletic association um, and the handball association. Uh, they're in, they're kind of cooperative, uh, although they are kind of having limited capacity in answering the checklist from this um, observer. But for the handball uh, handball association uh, association, they're really motivated to improve their governance. They brought up the uh, the early results to the regular uh, badminton association. The secretary general uh, obviously has very high capacity in answering the questions and assessing the the um, checklist very accurately, but uh, they are not really concerned with the outcome. All right, Sandy already kind of brought up uh, in early session that the uh, the overall index score for Indonesia falling into the weak category only 28%. And but I would like kind of uh, let you know that we have uh, appreciable state of internal accountability and control, 46%, and then uh, followed by democratic processes and societal responsibility with 29 and 21. But yeah, you saw it uh, from early session that Indonesia didn't really reach the required um, standard for the, the transparency. So what about the scores? So even though Pelti uh, or the Tennis Association didn't come back for me for the qualitative inquiry, uh, their website shows an adequate um, information for for the transparency. And then the Athletic Association, they came the least for the transparency with 2% and then democracy with 22%. Koi or the NOC uh, championing in three other areas, which is the democracy, they reached 47 percent. Uh, the accountability, they even reached 78 percent, and then they share the same uh, 40 percent with the Basketball Association of Pambasi. On the other hand, the sports committee only reached uh, 70 
0% for accountability, which not fulfilled, and then 0% for the social responsibility. So it's kind of, uh, you can see, you can observe from the total scores that Kowi and Prabasi kind of uh, having reached the top with 47% and 42%. And then coming close, the badminton or the PBSI, 35 and the swimming federation with PRSI is 34%. Then again, the sports community came as the least at the bottom with 14%. Okay, the implication. Uh, are they willing, are willing to comply? Uh, we cannot say for sure because uh, at least for the moment we cannot conclude that because you know, uh, this is uh, this primary is kind of new for us in Indonesia, and then they're like kind of having uh, priorities about their athletes and the government's directive about uh, international sporting achievements. And then experience leaders matters. Uh, you can see that the appreciable state of accountability and control in Indonesia Sports Federation is actually most mostly boosted by federation that are led by experienced top level business person i mean but again uh, we cannot conclude that because i kind of uh, calling for further investigation for this like kind of the relation between the uh, the business person and the and the federation that they're leading should the sports committee and the noc unify Actually, this has become the hottest and kind of most political issue uh, in Indonesia because like should should the NOC and sports committee committee unify, but actually it's already decided they should unify, but how they should unify. So I hope that the result in this research also can actually give a more comprehensive consideration for this policy maker in deciding the matters about the NOC and the sports committee. And then should there be any Indonesian specific good governance? Because I kind of wondering myself, is the framework take into account the differences in cultural settings? And then to be completely honest, for us, it, the framework is rather European centric. So it's not really catered to the, the way that Indonesia doing the democratic processes, something like that. So should there be any new tailored specific for Indonesia so that we, we can actually assess Indonesia um, system more comprehensively or more close, to, like more close to the reality or something like that? Or maybe the National Sports Governance Observer want to expand to actually cater to these kind of different settings of, of governance in in Asia or in other country. So that's all from me. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, Renata. Um, we will now head over to Ukraine and I have the pleasure to introduce Ola Borisova, Vice Rector at the National University of Physical Education and Sports. So please. Perfect, so uh, the presentation is here, but you need to turn on your microphone. I think we're still missing your sounds. Now you hear me? Yes, there it is. Thank you. Yes, excellent. Uh, good day, dear colleague, dear friends. Um, for me, it's very pleasant to take part in this webinar. Uh, uh, this webinar, we do a big uh, walk and now we have a second round of our researches. Uh, Ukraine take uh, active part in these researches and in this slide you can see that we 
issue uh, aid federation uh, to umbrella federation national olympic committee and sport committee of ukraine its organization which uh, develop uh, uh, non-olympic sports also you can see that we have two small federation uh, two um, three medium and two large federation uh, I want to say that uh, Ukrainians have uh, more than um, 30 years independence and now we rebuilt our um, system, administrative common system mechanism. That's why we have some good res uh, results, but not uh, as changes we have as soon as we want. To change uh, my slides. Can you help me? No. My slide don't change. Okay. 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 Now changing. In this slide, you can to see the summary of implementation of the principle of good governments in the activities of sport organization. Uh, they're not so high, but in the general, they are good. The better we can see the transparency, 50%, it's moderate, and another democracy, accountability, and so, uh, so social responsibility, it's weak uh, through the, uh, probably 38%. In this slide, you can to see the scores on the four um, dimension and for, from our uh, federation. Uh, also, through these uh, researches, we have uh, we can to see the positive moments of performance of sports organization of Ukraine. It's a positive trend towards the development and implementation of codes of ethics. Uh, it's presentation of many documents of the websites, regular holding of the board meeting and general meeting with registration and corresponding minutes, a very wide practice of the being able to appear decision, establishment of uh, garams, uh, a large number of seminars held by the Ministry of Youth of Sports of Ukraine, National Olympic Committee, uh, Sport Committee of Ukraine. A positive change in gender, social responsibility and activities and anti-doping combat. Uh, on this uh, slide, we try, uh, we try to sum the disadvantages of our uh, issues, and you can see that we have uh, the seven main uh, log of the short term and long term development strate uh, strategies, limited financial resource of sports federation, violation of the democratic principle regarding of the electoral process due the lack of the registration on management position. The desire of sports organization to improve political and businessmen in the leadership in increase their financial capacity. A lack of the management profiles in organization which gives us the opportunity for persons who don't have a appropriative competence or experience. A weak participa uh, participants in the political process by the main sport people, athletes, coaches, reference and volunteers and lack of the self-assessment practice for the activities, lack on risk management and involvement of the external experience in the assessment. Uh, during the, our shows, we see the promising ways. It's uh, on our opinion, it's eight. First, it's comp uh, complaints with the government's commitment to the good governments in sport. Uh, consideration in the distribution of public fun uh, funding among, among sports organization, the complexion of the extra, uh, experiment of the autonomy of sport federation, obligation on systematic uh, accountability uh, and long term planning of the sport federation, uh, priority and communication, uh, development of details instruction on the practice uh, application of good governments, 
and raising awareness among the representative of sport organization and uh, uh, strengthening control by international sport organization. I want to say that very interesting moment in this year when we have issues, we have two elections in different organization and our team and the man, manager Sandy have to see that the database changing during our issues. Uh, we would like to thank you uh, for the offer to take part in the project. Positive developments of, in some organizations have already taken place during data collection and uh, systematic work of the government, the public and international organization is needed. Let's work together. Thanks for attention. And thank you very much, Olya, and thank you for uh, to all the presenters uh, for your presentation. I will uh, now try to bring in my colleague Kirsten to um, hear if there is any questions from the chat for the panel. And I'm here. Yes, there are some questions. Um, they sort of mostly around a methodology. Um, some of it is if you like, fairly basic information about the, the the approach, and I think maybe Sandy, you could you could you could reply to to the question of I mean, what types of sports have we selected uh, to to uh, to survey, and uh, in what way are we making them, in, and and how does that facilitate comparison? That was one of the questions. Uh, and um, well, start there while I gather my thoughts on the other one. Yes, perfect. Maybe Sandy, you could uh, start with that one. Yeah, just many thanks. Um, I've also seen uh, the chat now after presentation uh, that is quite uh, going on. Some questions about the methodology. So the NSGO follows um, a standardized procedure. So that is uh, important to consider. Uh, whereby um, five, usually five, uh, well, five sports um, should be included in the benchmarking in order to make comparisons. So these are uh, the most important sports such as uh, football, handball, swimming, tennis and uh, athletics. Uh, and then we, we looked at uh, the opportunity for uh, two to three uh, sports that are then basically very traditional or have a national importance uh, for the countries uh, under consideration. So um, it is definitely an, an interesting procedure to, to understand in, in yeah, uh, in, in what in what way comparisons can actually be made. I think in the chat there were also some discussions about the cultural um, and social um, backgrounds um, or situations that are applicable to the different countries. I think that's a very valuable comment or very worthwhile comment that um, might provide an avenue for future research. Um, and I think uh, also to add what Jens said at the beginning, with this methodology that, that is a standardized one, that is basically also uh, yeah, um, what the objective is to make some some comparison and especially also to, to, to start a debate or to start um, thinking about what could be improved, what could be um, uh, added uh, in terms of the specific context of the, of the federations in their countries. Uh, that is, I think, a very valuable point, but we cannot make absolute uh, comparisons um, all over. Um, I hope that answers the questions a bit um, about mm -hmm. the methodology. Yes. Another question that's been raised in a number of ways is the relationship between the researchers and, and the organizations that are being researched. One phrase is that, so apart from, um, from, uh, from uh, uh, no, sorry, I rephrased, how, how do we attempt to ensure that the people who are doing the assessing are doing it in a comparable and objective manner and, and, and you know, can can work separately from the organizations they study. Sandy, I think that would be fair enough for you to answer as well. Did he freeze? <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't. I didn't freeze. I just, I just uh, mute, uh, unmuted and mute again. Um, Yes, uh, it's uh, it's a uh, of course also fair for question. Um, uh, we have we have included included people uh, from 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 research institutions. Um, in most in most cases, this have been universities, 
uh, with uh, with which play the game has a has a has an association for for a long time. So where we also say uh, that uh, from our perspective, uh, we 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 trust uh, we trust them that they are. Uh, Taking the, the standardized methodology on board, that they uh, score and evaluate uh, the the uh, federations uh, to the best to the best possible and, and, and objective extent. Um, like I said, and I have been reviewing I have been reviewing uh, the data sheets and and the reports. And, and as Jens has said, I'm not sure if I'm very popular with these people there. I hope so still. Uh, but it is it is also it is also a challenge definitely um, to apply to apply the, the, the 274 indicators uh, very strictly uh, to uh, to the context uh, again I would repeat myself um, so so it's uh, that there might be some yeah some room uh, where where you need to make a decision uh, in in terms of the scoring and that that can only be discussed uh, I think in yeah, in 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 a bilateral uh, sense or so. Um, but as as I said, we we trust these people and we we trust that they are they are they they have produced very objective results. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I spot one question for uh, Renata, and um, mm -hmm. it goes that. Um, uh, the one asking it is saying is that based on the result, Indonesia is considerably one of the countries with the third worst results. So, Renata, in your view, um, the question is, is that because the federations are heavily influenced by practical politics? Uh, that's kind of, uh, that's not a difficult question to answer. I mean, yeah, it's not difficult to answer, but actually I need to be very careful about it. <laughs> so I, I, I really cannot say for sure because there are like kind of a wide variety of uh, federation conditions. So there are federation that really wants to improve, improve, improve. Especially like I see the pattern with with those that have the business executive as the chairman. But again, I really cannot say for sure for this uh, practical politics especially for for the the federation that cannot uh, that didn't come back to me for the quality qualitative inquiry so yeah apart from this politic um, politically safe to say it's also like huge gap between the big federation and then the small federation that's all that i can say <laughs> that's fine S stennis Dennis, uh, I would like to take a comment and frame it as a question for the whole panel. It's a comment that says, um, Ms. Vinata's observa observation regarding the European Western nature of governance standards being applied to sport globally is very important. There needs to be more consideration and research of the cultural context in which standards are being asked to be applied. In my opinion, this should be a key next step in the evolution of work in the field of sports governance. And now we actually have a panel, a very diverse panel, and I would like to know whether you share this view um, that this should be an important next step to, um, to look at what types of governance standards are being applied or whether the standards that we're using and that are the same all across, all, all across the sample that, that we have done so far are, are adequate. Yeah, so um, Renata is the one raising that uh, issue. So maybe we could ask Catalina if she has uh, met some of the same issues in her research. Indeed, uh, we do find them. Actually, my PhD starting now is based on these cultural differences coming from the global sports studies that are just put in our heads without much participation and without much saying. So I think it's, it's a very interesting position from Renata. I also believe that it's not only the, 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 the creation of the standards that should be analyzed from this cultural perspective, but also the way in which the different sport organizations are dealing with the message, mainly the language. Because as you know, we always work in English and, and for many countries, this language is inexistent in most of the of the citizen who are able to understand it or to speak it. And it's not only about the citizens, but the, the, the lecturers and, 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 and the professionals. So this is creating in somehow a big gap 
coming from Europe, Western countries, uh, information that is arriving here. And sometimes within translation, this can be like be lost uh, within the implementation. So I, I agree with Renata, but I think it's also important um, that organizations such as Play the Game uh, takes into account these barriers that we have in order to have in somehow a positive guidance. I know Sandy was one of the most positive guidance at the end of our, our research. Uh, but again, uh, it, it, it could be done previously in prevention. Uh, so that would be our position from Colombia. Thank you very much, Catalina. And I also uh, want to mention that uh, there's a new book out on good governance in sport by Arno Gerhardt and Frank van Eckeren. And there's a chapter on the transferability of Western principles and values in the governance of sports. Uh, I think Arnold has put a link in the chat to that uh, chapter and it's free for all to read. So, um, so uh, I think there's something uh, in relation to this question. I think we need to uh, take a look at the time. So Kirsten, maybe if there is one but question I, left. No, not really. Uh, I think I think maybe we could hear from Ukraine or. Yeah, sure. Or how do you have? Uh, another, okay. Yeah. Okay. I believe mm -hmm. not. No. No, I think okay. no, we think we've covered the gist of it. We cannot yeah. go into everything here. Exactly. Okay. Thank you again to all the, the presenters. We will have a short break for uh, 10 minutes now, um, and then we will be back. And uh, my colleague Aline will present the new online tool for the NSGO. So uh, see you all in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Excuse me, uh, Sandy. Uh, I have to overrule you a little bit and say it's an eight minutes break and we will be uh, resuming at uh, uh, 3.30 our time uh, in, in eight minutes uh, in order to. Yes, that's an overruling I can accept. So that's okay. <laughs> See you, See in you later. <clears throat> Hi, Sarah. Hi, greetings. Hi. Greetings. We're just on a short break. I don't know Hello. if you just jumped I've in. Been, uh, I've been in since two o'clock. Am okay. I uh, in the right link? Yes, you are. That's perfect. Excellent. That's See you in, in five, find any six. Other one. Yeah, perfect. Uh, we don't discuss anything offline or we're all good? We're all good. We're all good. Okay. Perfect. So far, Big credit to you. Excellent. Thank you. See you in five minutes. Great See you in a few minutes.
Hello everyone. I hope you have enjoyed the break. Had an extra cup of coffee or whatever you have been around to. We will now uh, resume the meeting. We have some very interesting guests over the next uh, hour. I can see Sarah Lewis uh, has arrived, uh, but I we are still waiting for the two gentlemen for the panel, but uh, <clears throat> we have knocked on their shoulders and I hope they will uh, they will uh, soon appear. But we have another item that we should also uh, introduce. And uh, my colleague Aline Bedaf has spent many, many, many hours uh, over the past weeks turning the 274 indicators and 46 principles into a useful online tool that will enable if you question the credibility of our researchers, you can become your own researcher. And and uh, and uh, Aline will uh, tell uh, how. Aline, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you, Jens. I think I already shared my screen. Can you nod if you can see it? Yes, perfect. Well, as we now have such a comprehensive data set with scores of uh, almost 200 national federations from 25 different countries, we have made a benchmarking tool that gives the opportunity to make comparisons to and between all federations uh, that have been part of the uh, the NSGO. And uh, the benchmarking tool gives the opportunity to compare federations on their overall score, but also on the four dimension scores. And to make relevant comparisons, you can filter on specific countries and sports, but also select the federations you find interesting. And besides comparing the federations uh, that already have been part of the NSGO research, it is also possible to fill out the score sheet yourself and calculate your own score. Um, because the NSGO score sheet exists of many different indicators, we've made a score sheet for each dimension, uh, which makes the online tool easier to use. Uh, besides the NSGO tool, we also made a tool for the Sports Governance Observer, which focuses on the 11 international federations. And both tools are now accessible from Play the Games uh, website, and the functions and user interface are identical. So now we'll, this is the uh, the NSGO tool, which you can see here, and I will show you some features in the uh, in the tool. Uh, this is the first tab, and this is the home page. Uh, here you can read about the National Sports Governance Observer uh, on the left side, and on the right side you find some instructions about how the tool functions. But the first uh, tab with uh, with information and the scores is the index score tab. Uh, here you can find all the overall scores for the internet for the national federations that have been part of the NSGO research in the previous years. And it's a lot of different federations, as you can see here, when it's called to the right. On the right side of the screen, you can filter on sports, countries, or specific federations. So if you choose uh, some countries, like I will do now, I pick Belgium and Brazil, you can see the federations from these two countries. You can also select on sports, so if I choose athletics and football, you get those federations that are in Belgium or Brazil and belong to the sports, athletics and football. Uh, the other filters, they, they, uh, they only choose those who are available left. So if I mark sports here and countries in the bottom, you can on the organization filter, you can only filter on the organizations that are left based on the other filters. Well, this graph it shows the, uh, the overall index score but you can get the dimension scores with a mouse over. So as I try now, you can see this is the Athletics Federation in Belgium, and you can see the four dimension scores of this federation. And you can do that for all the federations. Uh, so this is the main score with the index scores and where you also can see the, the dimension scores. The next four tabs uh, are the dimension scores, and they actually keep the filter that you choose on the first one. But you can change it here on the right hand, where you can change the countries and the sports and the federations, which you picked on the first one. So the filter uh, is still existing here. A mouse over on, on this page gives uh, information about what kind of sports it is and what kind of country the federation is of. If you would like to calculate your own dimension score, you have to focus on the gray box on the right side. There is a short explanation about which indicators are applicable for your federation because it depends on uh, the size of your federation. And if you want to open it, you can click on the link in the in the bottom and then it opens in a new tab. Uh, first, you have to look 
on the right which uh, which federation uh, you, you want to answer the questions for. If you're a small federation, then you have to look for the letter B in the questionnaire. This is the questionnaire. Uh, the questionnaire does not save your answers. So if you close this tab, your answers will be lost. You can answer all the questions uh, in, in this screen. And after each question, you can see uh, the, the letters belonging to the three categories. So if you're a basic federation, you have to answer all the questions where the B is uh, behind the question. So this is the tool with all the indicators for transparency. Um, you can calculate your score by answering all the indicators. Scroll to the bottom and press calculate dimension score. If you forget to answer on some of the indicators, uh, you get a warning saying that you lack some answers. After calculating the dimension score, you can either take a print screen or you can uh, print uh, in your browser window so you get your results. The results you calculate here, you can compare in the Power BI with the, the, with the dimension scores from the other federations which you find interesting. So that's how you can calculate your own score and compare it with the other federations that has been part of the NSGO research before. Now I showed you the transparency tab. The other tabs are similar. Uh, it's only the other dimensions. And also here you can open the dimension score and go into the tool to answer and uh, calculate your own score. Um, th so th this is uh, about our, our new online NSGO tool, which you can find on our website. Uh, and as I told in the beginning, we also made an SGO tool for the international federations, and this tool has the same user interface and functions as this tool. Thank you. Thank you mu very much, uh, Aline. As uh, we are a bit delayed, I will simply just ask uh, people to go and test the tool and send us questions if uh, you experience problems. We are very, very glad. Uh, that we have this possibility. We hope that many students at universities, uh, many sports leaders, um, many athletes, many government officials will just make it wherever you roam in the sporting world that you will feel that uh, it is uh, interesting uh, for you to test your own federation or just compare what has already been benchmarked. Now I would like to uh, welcome our panel of very distinguished and experienced uh, uh, sports leaders and researchers. Um, Sarah Lewis uh, is the former uh, Director uh, General or General Secretary uh, of uh, the International Ski Federation. Uh, Miguel Poyares Maduro is a professor at the uh, European uh, University Institute in uh, Florence and it's Portuguese, and um, João Paulo Almeida is the uh, Director General of the uh, Portuguese Olympic Committee. We are very happy to have you here to make some comments on sports gen uh, governance in general, and to the extent that you have had over the, you, I think I, you got the copy of the report or summary uh, some uh, 20 hours ago or so, you may not have had time to study. We don't e expect you to have learned everything by heart, but uh, knowing that you can all speak about governance uh, just by, uh, you have a, a button that is easy to push and, and uh, considerations of governance will come out. We are uh, uh, very, very confident that you can contribute to this discussion. Um, I would like to start just uh, a short round where you just, uh, out of uh, your experience so far, if you would just mention the two or three most important uh, features of governance that you would see strength, you would like to see strengthened right now. If you you can pick, if you have been here for the last hour, and I, I know some of you have, uh, then you can pick and choose from what you have heard, or you may just build on your own experiences. And uh, Sarah Lewis, will you uh, will you start? Will you be the first to say what are what are your main observations? Certainly, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to join you and uh, it's been a very engaging. A very engaging webinar until now, so thank you very much to play the game for all your work. Governance is so much in the spotlight at the moment. Good governance within sport and, and sport 
trying to play a role model in society means that uh, this is something that all of the sports organizations have to take very, very seriously. And certainly the role of all stakeholders, that everybody is, feels that they have an alignment, have a role, have, can participate in the, in the organization uh, has become more and more a focal point. Everyone has their role uh, and the athletes are very fundamental to this. The diversity within the, within the organization representing all of the community, everyone who is participating, and that doesn't only refer to, uh, to gender, um, it refers to all of the different stakeholders, and you've identified a lot of them coming through the report. Uh, athlete engagement, uh, gender balance, representative of the sport, but representative of society at large. Different cultures, different backgrounds, the volunteers, the officials, the professional workforce, the organisers, the sponsors, the partners, the medias. Everyone has their role to play. So this has uh, become, I think, more and more a key element over the past uh, 18 months that we've, all been, uh, that we've all been living with because there's been the opportunity and the time to, uh, to actually take a deep dive and to uh, find out more about the structures and the organisations of, uh, of the, the different associations. What I would like to perhaps highlight, having been uh, involved with your excellent survey since you began for, for international federations, and uh, the, the edition that you published in both in 2018, 2016, I was personally very much involved with actually completing it for the International Ski Federation. In fact, all three editions we did, but you paid particular intention to doing a deeper dive uh, into, uh, into skiing when it came to the 2018 edition. Uh, and um, recall very, very well uh, the more than 200 questions. Uh, what I found and what we found as an organization was that there were actually many elements that we had fulfilled but hadn't published them. They were not sufficiently transparent. And I'm sure a lot of the, uh, the nations, the national governing bodies who have undertaken the survey will see, yes, we're, we're doing that. This is actually something that's happening within our organization, but we're not communicating it properly. We haven't published it on our website. It's not transparent enough. And we need to make sure that we, we go through and we, we do share our information. So this was an important lesson that we had. And another very important uh, lesson was the fact that basically we found that the survey and um, the different questions served as a kind of a checklist. It served really as a strong message to go through and check all these points. These are the elements expected and required within good governance. What do we accomplish? What are we accomplishing and not publishing? What don't we accomplish and why? Is this something that can be handled rather easily, actually, within, uh, within the management, within the board, with very clear explanations? Is this something that all of the member associations will um, immediately say, yes, of course. Why haven't we followed up with that? Is this something that is... Uh, a very clear decision required of the board and then even of the, uh, of the General Assembly. So it serves as an important checklist to go through and uh, to, to do that. So it's not a case of reinventing the wheel, starting from zero, using your report and similarly uh, shout out to uh, I Trust Sport and I saw that Roland Jack is, uh, is present for the work that he'd done specifically with, um, uh, with the, the different associations, ASOIF, Summer Sports, IWOF, Winter Sports, and now more recently with, um, uh, with ARIFs and with IMS as well. 
uh, supporting their work. But, um, and this is across all of those member associations. You have picked a cross section, but there was still a lot of good comparable uh, information and uh, sharing and learning. Uh, and uh, I would really recommend everybody to use the report that's been published as a, as a checklist, lessons learned, what do we do, what do we need to do better, uh, and, and where actually do we do, we do very, very well? And uh, we can perhaps share that as best practice. So I think at the outset that uh, would be important that I would like to, to put on the table, that it very, very much is important to engage everybody who is part of the sport and help them feel that, and, and really show that they do belong to the sport. Everyone has a lot of value to bring. Thank you, uh, uh, Sarah. I, I think we could not have uh, employed, if we had employed somebody, <laughs> someone could give a more fiery recommendation of uh, the benchmarking tool. We are very happy that you uh, felt uh, that it was useful to be uh, at the receiving end uh, of our uh, benchmarking on several occasions. And now I'd like to ask uh, João Paulo, uh, do you share that viewpoint uh, when, when when the researchers look at uh, your organization, is it a bit inconvenient or do you see it as an opportunity? Uh, what, what, is, what is your take on uh, being benchmarked and what, can, what have you been using this for? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jens. I hope you can all uh, see and hear me in good conditions. Okay, yes. good. Well, actually, we, we have come through a, a wide number of um, uh, external uh, assessment or even self-assessment tools on integrity and good governance throughout the years. But uh, first and foremost, I, uh, due to this experience here at the NOC and working with the, our national federations as well, I want to commend you for uh, this impressive piece of work uh, convening 15 countries from three uh, continents. It is very, very difficult to, uh, to, to, to achieve such a tremendous uh, uh, result because uh, we know that usually spot governing bodies, they live on denial to lots of issues related to integrity and good governance. And it's not easy to engage uh, all of these stakeholders to fulfill uh, uh, um, uh, a questionnaire with lots of questions uh, then like the, the one that you have uh, circulated. So this is a, a, a remarkable job from the network of researchers that have been involved uh, in this. That said, it is quite important in my opinion to emphasize one uh, main finding that I, I think it is quite important if we want to uh, walk the talk around the good governance issues in sport, which is uh, the results in the fourth pillar of uh, or in the fourth dimension of your survey, meaning the social and corporate responsibility. In my opinion, this is a clear sign about what I have said that sport officials, they are not properly aware of the impact of governance issues and uh, integrity issues uh, and the, the, the role that sport can uh, play, uh, notably to, to help to change these unprecedented circumstances poses by, posed by the pandemic. And what this means, this means if you can have a good uh, strategical framework, but if you don't have embedded in your culture, uh, uh, a governance culture, uh, as we are all, all know, uh, 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 culture eats strategy at the breakfast. And so it doesn't work. And uh, that's the reason why it's so difficult even here in Portugal and even after so many scandals notably related with mental issues, sexual harassment, manipulation of sports competitions. And we know that the Macalene Convention, for instance, uh, has only seven uh, member states uh, who have ratified 
since uh, 2014, I believe, when he entered in, into signature. So this represents a huge blocking to pave uh, this way in a, um, in a, in a strong uh, and in a fast manner. And the question is, what can we do to speed up, to accelerate and to clear these barriers? This is the question I uh, uh, ask here at my NOC every single uh, a day. And the answer that I have is only uh, one. Those who invest in sport, local or public government, sponsors, broadcasters, they need to demand more. They need to uh, uh, request to the, the the sport governing bodies not only to use these tools as Sarah was saying as a kind of a checklist but follow it up and what follow it up means means to implement a concrete tangible roadmap to tackle the shortcomings that have been assessed through this kind of mechanisms because if not we will be here from two years uh, looking the, the the findings on social and corporate responsibility even lower than uh, they are uh, they are now and this should be a, a reason of concern uh, for all of us and so and to conclude it is quite important think tanks like play the game or uh, global uh, organizations like global athletes for instance to put pressure to the decision uh, makers come forward and walk the talk and implement uh, the, um, uh, the a roadmap uh, to tackle the, the issues uh, where they uh, have uh, failed. Because uh, as we have seen in the recent report of ASO, if the future of global sport, uh, sport governing bodies they are they know they can no longer stay uh living on denial to these issues and saying that they are delivering a wider social uh, uh, uh mission uh, where they don't have to uh, uh, abide by uh, uh, certain rules and certain procedures that's not tolerable that's not acceptable and governments are uh, uh, looking to that are clearly uh, um, saying this is no longer the solution. And as the president of the IOC said when he presented the, the agenda 2020, this is a matter of change or to be changed. I have no doubts uh, about it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, João Paulo. Before I pass your question on to Miguel Maduro, I'd like to tell all participants that you can uh, ask questions to the panel in the uh, uh, chat function, and uh, I invite you to do so. Uh, Kirsten will, like uh, before the break, uh, uh, try to organize the questions. Uh, if, if there are too many of them, we may bundle them a little bit. But uh, Miguel Maduro, uh, here comes a very strong call uh, from a person from the sports movement for those who finance the sports movement to react much more strongly. Uh, you are an outsider and you are, have been represented government in various uh, 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 functions in your life. Uh, you have been a minister, you have also uh, been uh, in the European High Court uh, and and now you are a publicly financed uh, researcher. Do you agree that we cannot expect any programs, progress from inside the sports organizations and that the outside world should uh, react much stronger? Yes, yeah, I, I do agree that possibility of reform. Hello? Yes. Can you listen? Try again. There was a short okay. moment. I'm, I'm having a problem. I hope I, I don't get out of the sound if so I'll reconnect again with a different thing. Um, I was saying that I, I do agree that I see no possibility of reform from within sports organizations. I've been saying this with some colleagues in recent times. We wrote an op-ed regarding specifically the football sector, uh, but I don't think the problem is much different in other sports uh, federations, only the money is bigger in, in football. Therefore, the problems are uh, commensurate 
to those amounts of money, money and therefore are also be bigger. But the fundamental govern governance flaws in the world of, of, of sport are common. And as I said, I wrote an op-ed with three other colleagues in the Euro News, a long op-ed, was almost an essay, a few weeks ago, and we were calling for the European Union to intervene and to regulate. We think this is not even a problem that can be addressed simply through outside pressure from sponsors. I've witnessed that at FIFA, where I was for a short period of time as chair of the governance committee in charge of monitoring and trying to implement governance reforms. And I realized that the, first, the pressure on the part of sponsors and those funding only works for a relatively limited period of time. And second, increasingly, uh, federations are looking for financing coming from less uh, uh, um, uh, from uh, sources that are less concerned with uh, uh, with the governance integrity than traditional uh, uh, funding sources and tra traditional companies. So you mentioned uh, examples. Um, well, I mean, uh, 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 I think uh, we all know, for example, there's almost no Western company that has uh, uh, initiated and started new contracts with sports federation with the big with the big entities, at least in the world of football. That is one I know better. Uh, uh, um, in and and therefore, I think that that decreases the possibility that change will happen that way. That's why I think both the social relevance of sport and but particularly its market impact. I mean, there's few studies that try to measure exactly what is the impact of sports in GDP, but some at the global level estimated at around 2% of GDP, what is remarkable. And it is remarkable that an area where, for, and by the way, some of the companies that have most progressed in the FT ranking of the 500 top companies are sports companies too. And it is remarkable that this economic sector is subject to no public scrutiny, no public oversight, no public regulation effective of any kind whatsoever. And so the results that you show us is the consequence of that. They are, they are sad. Uh, um, I mean, to see that there's not even one <laughs> that reaches a minimum level of acceptability. Uh, uh, and they're all bad. The question is the extent of how bad they are. Um, and even if we look at the results, and uh, I had the possibility of, re of reading the summary that you sent me yesterday night uh, of all the results, if you read them, we realize that in fact they are probably even worse than, 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 than what is there because those uh, standards where nevertheless they perform better, the sports federation, are standards that are uh, um, linked to very formal requirements like publishing the statutes, or uh, uh, things of that type. Instead, what does not have to do with compliance with formal rules, but involves really a, a, a much deeper uh, governance culture, there the, the results are even worse than the bad results that, that we see overall. And so my proposals, you asked me what will be my proposals, my proposals will be first, because I believe that there will be no reform from within sports organization, I would uh, uh, um, ask public institutions to no longer make nice resolutions such as the one pending in the European Parliament that now at the moment, that then limit itself to say that they encourage the federations and sports organizations to improve their governance standards. This is a public obligation to regulate a substantial area of our market activities. And we have uh, and the reason why there is no reform uh, is, uh, in the first place, the reason why it is crucial for this to be subject to public regulation. And it is that there's a deep conflict of interest on uh, uh, the economic dimension of, uh, uh, of these organizations that are themselves promoting events and regulators of this economic activity. There's no other area of the market that I know where the economic operators in the market regulate themselves. Uh, uh, and this is what happened in sports. Uh, 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 and so all the discussions that we see in football or even recent with the IOC, uh, I wrote a comment this week in Portugal regretting very much the role the uh, IOC has played and the communication of the IOC regarding the, 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 the Chinese tennis player 
Uh, and I think it's a confirmation of the fact that the IOC, I mean, has a deep conflict of interest in being the organizer, getting the money of the Olympics, and at the same time having to regulate and protect athletes that are supposed to compete in those Olympics. And they can't play that role. So we need to require them to have a strict separation between regulatory functions and the functions of or, as organizers of sports events. That will be a first uh, must, in my view, from the governance point of view. Second one, to open up the structures of representation. Uh, uh, if we see there's a recent study, 70%, 70% of sports federation presidents run and oppose. So there's not even competition for the electoral results. Uh, um, there's very little renewal. There's no rep almost no representation of women. We can only change this if we force open up representation. What sports organizations are political cartels. So they need to be open up to a much broader scope of representing interests. And third aspect that in my view will be crucial is the genuine independence of the disciplinary, ethical and judicial or quasi judicial bodies that control the application of the rules. There's only rule of law if those that are supposed to review the actions of the FIFA bodies, governance body or the IOC or the federation bodies themselves do not depend on those that they are supposed to review, for example. And that's not the case in sports. Members okay. of disciplinary and judicial bodies basically are at the disposal of the political leaderships that they are supposed to control and review. So this, in my view, will be the third priority. Thank you, Miguel. I think it's evident to pass uh, these opinions on to Sarah for a comment because, uh, Sarah, you have experienced uh, both sides on the way uh, of the way the political system uh, uh, works. You uh, you tried actually to to run in a contested election for president, and you know what what uh, kind of culture you are up against uh, in 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 that respect. But I would also like to say that with regard to the many years that you were at the administrative helmet of, of international skiing, would you have liked to see a stronger government involvement in order to push for much better regulation? Certainly uh, independent regulation, and independent oversight, uh, whether or not it's uh, government uh, or it's um, uh, experts from from uh, a wider context in society, uh, absolutely. And um, over the last um, uh, few years, we introduced uh, external governance in several key areas. And the first one was with anti-doping, so that all decision-making from the first instant decision, whether or not that, that was a, a, a doping case or not, was taken out of the organization and uh, put in put uh, over to the court of arbitration anti-doping division which had no members of the organization in their uh, uh, yeah in their body their panels their investigatory commission we set up a, a whistleblowing hotline with uh, an independent company an independent organization who managed all that independently uh, of the International Ski Federation and uh, also had the responsibility for uh, the whole sports integrity uh, elements and any complaints that were issued to them, follow them up and take actions. Uh, and but we don't uh, see, Sarah, we don't, I yes. think it's very commendable, but uh, we have also seen quite a few committees called independent who are uh, do not really appear very independent if, for instance, they are uh, selected by... Uh, uh... No, no, I mean, this this took many, many years, uh, yes. and uh, this is really only in the very much latter years uh, that these... Um, but uh, yes, you, you know, you're, you're absolutely right, and I would say that, uh, in fact, on the last uh, survey carried out by iTrust Sport, uh, we ended in the, uh, the top six international federations, but uh, the the vast majority are still handling a lot of their their affairs internally. One of the reasons being the um, the resources that they have. It costs money to be able to do things externally and to set up uh, expert commissions uh, to uh, well, to employ 
as it were, out, outside uh, independent governments. Uh, and there are fees to be paid, there is expertise. So this is also um, one of the reasons as well. So uh, I absolutely uh, share the views of, of Miguel that the uh, sports federations need to be uh, have 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 uh, independent oversight from other bodies, and I think the IOC has also done a, a good job in involving outside uh, independent organisations to um, uh, to give them a strong uh, a strong oversight in terms of uh, audit uh, and uh, assessment and so on. And look work that you are doing with Play the Game and uh, other similar, uh, and other similar um, uh, analysis are exactly what sport is, is required. A lot of the time, things have been done in a certain way over many years, and there's just a lack of knowledge and understanding what has to be done. And uh, these things do have to be done. And a lot of the time... It's may I, may I ask you, Sarah? Yeah. May I ask you, uh, there was also the specific question about government and you accepted it could be part of an independent uh, oversight, but you have now dealt with national ski federations of many kinds, I presume. Uh, I don't know uh, the ski federations as well as, as you do, but they come from a variety of cultures, a variety of political settings, some from very authoritarian countries, some from very democratic countries. Would you have liked to see the government putting, uh, raising their demands vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, sport, would you have liked to see those federations under more public control? In a lot of cases, they, uh, they are. Uh, respectively, they do have uh, government involvement within their, uh, either within their board or within an oversight uh, a commission. And in fact, I would say a large number of them receive their funding from government bodies, which they only receive with uh, necessary steps and approvals and governance. And they've also been taking steps. Again, uh, not all of them, but uh, I don't think it's a case only, and, and I had a question here, about uh, international federations putting more pressure on their national federations. It's a case of them also helping, guiding, supporting them uh, in order to be able to do, to, to do that a lot of the cases because they don't know what to do and how to do it. So help them, give them templates, give them models, give them uh, support. And look, the vast majority haven't got anything to hide. They just are following what's always been done uh, when it wasn't really the norm that governments and, and um, let's say higher authorities would be would be involved, uh, sports governance, uh, the NOC, uh, and, and so on. But having a certain independence uh, is very important for the credibility for the public at large, uh, in order to be able to understand that the organisation is being run properly with. Uh, sound values, uh, with good ethics, with good morals, and with, with proper governance. And no, it isn't the case at the moment everywhere, but uh, it's not all, always a case because they're doing everything wrong. It's because a lot of the time they don't actually know what to do and how to accomplish it. So the organizations that are springing up and trying to help and support them do it, great. Uh, may, may I ask, uh, bring that on to João Paulo? Um, before we, we take the uh, questions in the chat, uh, would you like the Portuguese government to be a little bit stricter with your uh, national federations, those under the Olympic umbrella? Oh, very, very blatant to you. I would love it. And our government has the competences to do so. But I will be very clear to you on that matter, Jans. Uh, probably you at the play the game, you have a large collection of failing interventions of governments into sport. Here in Portugal, I also have. Uh, 
very serious ones. I don't want to point figures, but uh, fingers, but there are certain issues uh, involving cases of sexual harassment, sexual abuse that have been reported to the, pub the Portuguese public authorities, and they have not been properly followed up, neither by the government, neither by law enforcement. And this has to be clearly said. A huge amount of cases, manipulation of sports competitions, uh, malpractices in the governance of the institutions, allegations of fraud, corruption, nothing happens. Second, I should remember you the Larry Nassad case. Very famous, uh, very important, uh, unfortunately with lots of victims. Very recently, the, the US Department of State produces a long report uh, showing how uh, the FBI and the American law enforcement agencies mishandled the case and mishandled the, the, uh, the process. And that's the reason why I uh, prone to say, of course, the intervention of public authorities is, is crucial, but this has to uh, evolve end in end with pressure from watchdog organization, from public uh, opinion, from broadcasters and from other uh, uh, entities. Why is that? I, I would love to follow uh, uh, Miguel's opinion, but when I look, and you know, Jens, that I've been involved in lots of uh, this kind of soft law resolutions from the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, you know, DC, uh, European Union, I currently, I don't see anyone with enough power to confront these, I would say, quasi-state nation uh, organizations that the international federations uh, 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 represent. Why is that? Because they are uh, almost cartels and monopolies. Sporting, sport, you like it or not, is different in the way it is setting up from any other business. You cannot close, for instance, the Ski Federation and considering that we will come up another uh, 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 international body to govern, to govern ski, as you do, for instance, in the, in the uh, airline companies, in the banking uh, industry, uh, whatever. And so, uh, to answer directly to you, of course, I would love uh, the government to step in, and uh, in certain jurisdictions, it is already happening, Notably, in the aftermath of the of the of the of the COVID, but that's clearly not enough. Clearly not enough. Uh, Miguel has before Miguel uh, gets the floor. I just uh, like to add that, uh, seen from our viewpoint, our experience over the past years, it that it has really made a difference when public prosecutors act. This has uh, impressed the the sport international sports leaders who may have felt they lived in a kind of sanctuary. Uh, that suddenly uh, FBI was knocking on their door uh, if they did not uh, do things well, or, or uh, the Brazilian state authorities would arrest high-ranking IOC leaders in the early morning hours. And uh, or we have France, we have an, a, a number of examples. So there we see an impact of the, at least a temporary impact of the public involvement. But uh, uh, Miguel, I don't want to steal your thunder. No, I, I just want to clarify so as to prevent present. You falling out. Um, that, me, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? OK, and um, I, I just wanted to avoid any misunderstanding regarding my proposal and that of my uh, my colleagues, because uh, it seemed to me that there could be the risk at least of that misunderstanding. The first is that I absolutely agree with what Juan said, that it's very hard for national governments to regulate what is a private form of governance that is transnational in nature and that to a large extent have stronger powers than individual national governments. And that's why me and my colleagues, we argue that uh, that only the European Union is in a position to do it. And we provide the examples when the case study that we're using is football uh, and we say there is it, that's the only area where we've actually seen UEFA and FIFA trying to comply with standards uh, defined mostly by piecemeal intervention of the European Court of Justice or through the use of competition rules or free, move, or free, free movement rules. And the reason is simple because individual national government will try, as Juan was saying, to suspend a national federation for not complying with such good governance principles. 
uh, that state will probably get excluded from all the international competitions. <laughs> uh, 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 and instead, uh, uh, no sport or uh, um, transnational organization can do that to the European mm. Union because they cannot exclude the 27 member states at the same time, for example, from the Euro Cup or the, or the World Cup. That's why, contrary to what had happened in other areas, when uh, they were faced with decisions of the European Commission or the European Court of Justice, UEFA and FIFA did comply, did accept it, and did change their rules. So that shows that there is only one normative, effective normative authority to regulate and scrutinize at what is, in its own nature, a transnational activity and a transnational body. And that's the European Union in our view, the only one effective one. We could think about a mechanism such as WADA, uh, 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 for the doping that Sarah was mentioning at the international level. We could think of a similar body for governance, but I, I simply don't think that there will be the, uh, 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 the political uh, uh, um, will at the international level to set up such an agency for governance as it was set up for anti-doping. Uh, anti uh, so I think that um, until that is the case, the European Union should make use of the fact that it has that normative authority and can do it. The second aspect that I wanted to clarify is that we, were, we are not arguing for governments to start to regulate sports issues themselves. What we believe is that there ought to be, the European Union could set up either an agency or a licensing system that will basically only supervise and review that uh, sports transnational organizations comply with the set of good governance principles, that they're independent, uh, uh, both judiciary disciplinary auditing bodies are genuinely independent, that they have a clear separation of regulatory functions from those of organizing events, uh, that they have principles reviewing and preventing conflicts of interest and all those. That will be uh, what, in our view, the European Union should do, should do. Basically say, OK, if you are responsible basically for regulating this market, then you need to comply with these go good governance principles. And, and we will review that. That's what we are arguing. We're not arguing for governments to get into the nitty gritty of, of, of the aspects of, of sport. Thank you, Miguel. And uh, your comment on uh, an overall global body for governance uh, triggered a reaction uh, uh, from Sarah. Um, microphone. Yes, it did. Uh, and that is to say that um, the IOC set this up uh, several years ago. I kind of have lost uh, 18 months somewhere. So let me say four or five years ago. And uh, this is called IPACS, the uh, International Partnership Against Corruption in Sport. And so uh, this was an intergovernmental uh, group um, where um, the various different bodies, the intergovernmental groups are involved. And uh, this has been very effective. And um, Miguel and Anquo are absolutely right that uh, there has been an effect when the governments have, have got involved and that they have uh, sought out uh, issues that are going on. But I think it goes further than that. It's not only a case of dealing with, um, uh, with corruption. It, it's a case of supporting and helping and having continual oversight actually into the organizations and not only uh, when it becomes um, a, a crisis like we've seen with different um, different issues that have happened over the years and, and a lot of the time it's taken the media uh, to uh, identify the uh, the issues and uh, to then actually root it out or try to uh, to root it out as we've seen with uh, with different major issues but it's the general governance uh, of the organizations as well. Uh, Sarah, I think, uh, thank you uh, for following up. Uh, now, now I think we have to give the chat room uh, a chance. Uh, uh, before the few minutes we have left, we have about uh, six, seven minutes late, so we will have some brief questions and brief answers. Uh, Kirsten, have you found? <laughs> <laughs> Something that would in, encourage brief answers, I'm not so sure, but uh, there is an interesting question here. Um, who can and should pressure national governments and national law enforcement agencies to intervene and investigate abuses in sport governing bodies? Where do we go 
And the argument is that existing international organizations seem unable to help stop these sport crimes happening in, at the national level. So this idea of bringing in um, national law enforcement, how do we go about it and should we go about it? Thank you. Uh, Zhao? Yeah, uh, uh, that, that is the typical kind of question that goes to my, uh, my previous answer, the engagement of uh, uh, public opinion uh, and civil society uh, to uh, move these issues up into the political agenda is critical. We have seen, for instance, uh, in in Larry Nassar case, the role that the Indianapolis uh, uh, Star, the, uh, the the newspaper, has played to 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 take this out of a, of a murky waters and uh, sprout uh, uh, an investigation with the football leagues as well where a syndicate of uh, uh, newspapers played a very important role and with all the leaks of this of this life it's critical that civil society uh, played a meaningful role in order uh, to put pressure on decision making organizations not only sport governing bodies but political institutions uh, uh, to pave this way because if not things will uh, stay the same Sorry. Sorry, Miguel, will you comment on this? Who, who should push for, for change? Well, I mean, uh, um, as I said, I think the European Union is, uh, due to its transnational dimension, is in a better position than national governments to pressure for, for change and to actually introduce change. It's the only one that, in my view, really has the regulatory authority and capacity over transnational bodies such as this, because the, the problem is that if a national government will intervene uh, to correct the problems of governance in one national federation, it may actually be second-guessed by, by uh, uh, um, the international federation that will consider uh, uh, that intervention by the national government as political interference in sport and therefore undermine the capacity of the state to, to, to do that. And by the way, there is a risk that some states could use that to in fact interfere politically. Uh, 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 the fact is that political interference already happens a lot in sports, but not through regulation. It happens, for example, through political members being at the same time in boards of sports organizations and, uh, and all that. Uh, uh, in some countries, uh, you even have uh, 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 members of government that are almost presidents of federations at the, at, at the same time. So the confusion is even, even bigger than that. So the argument that is used by international federations about political independence uh, is used uh, uh, quite uh, erratically, not to say arbitrarily, the, uh, by the sports federations themselves. So, but for that reason, the first argument that I will say is that it needs to be transnational. Uh, the other thing is that what we're talking, and that's where there's always the possibility today, is uh, uh, you're talking about, uh, I, because I think the problem at its origin is one has to be addressed through regulation. Uh, uh, criminal uh, authorities intervening is because we are, we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg. If we have such, I mean, the president of WADA said that 25% of the money involved in football, in football, sorry, in sports today, is in the hands of criminal organizations. I don't know where he, he came up with this statistic, but it's a frightening st statistic, 25%. Uh, 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 now, uh, uh, but this 25%, if exists, all the criminal cases that we hear about uh, happen to a large extent because upstream, the mechanisms of transparency, of accountability, of independent control, uh, of prevention of conflicts of interest do not work well. So at its origin, this needs to be dealt with as a problem of regulation. There, we lack a coherent, comprehensive and appropriate regulatory framework for sports. That is the fundamental problem that we have. Everything else follows from that. And I think that coherent regulatory framework can only actually be developed effectively, yeah. effectively at the transnational level. Sports, criminal authorities investigations will always come too, too late. And I, by, the, by the way, if they should happen, a lot of them should be promoted in terms of transnational cooperation or even transnational bodies such as the new European public prosecutor. 
because of the transnational nature of the financial fluxes that are involved in sports. Thank you. As uh, Kirsten predicted, uh, inspiring short answers is not easy, but it was a good answer. And uh, <laughs> we are nearing the end of the uh, uh, webinar. I would uh, like uh, Miguel to take this as your concluding remarks. Uh, um, and uh, I would like, uh, before I go to, to, to Sarah and Jao Paulo, to some concluding remarks. And then I would ask you, Miguel, if you could please share a link to the article you referred to that you have recently written, if you can share that in the chat. Um, sure, it, it, I will do that now. And, uh, uh, yeah. and uh, yeah. this, the, I can, I can uh, give you back uh, my debit in terms of time to the other two speakers now, if you want. Yeah. Well, I okay. look for the article and post it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Miguel. Uh, 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 Sarah, um, do you have anything yeah. you would like to? Wind? I'm I'm sorry to those who have asked questions in the chat that we, we cannot deal with, but we have to re be respectful of the the uh, minute that we will where we soon will end. I think it's been an excellent, engaging discussion, and I would like to underline that I believe that uh, sport must be accountable to society. It must be, and therefore it means involving the public authorities. And uh, therefore, if this can be built up on an international basis to cover the international sports perspective, then this would be uh, optimal, no question. And uh, really, uh, sport must understand that it doesn't, is under the scrutiny of, of the public at large. And therefore, there is no option other than to uh, uh, to be open, to be uh, fully scrutinised and have nothing to hide. There is nothing to hide. Do it properly. Thank you, Sarah uh, and Jao. Uh, Jao Paulo, what would you 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 yeah. had uh, you raised your hands before? Yeah, I, I will be I will be very very briefly. I raised and with that I, I will conclude to, uh, to say that. Uh, it's quite important that we all play our role and uh, public and international authorities do the same. And we we all know that uh, sport uh, has been tarnishing uh, uh, as a vital ground to criminal infiltration. And we know that with the manipulation of sports competitions. And to conclude, this is a good example how the European institutions play a very detrimental role to pave this way, to tackle uh, this scourge. Why is that? You all know that uh, the, the Convention of the Council of Europe on the Manipulation of the Sports Competitions is the is the single uh, binding international legal document to tackle this problem. The European Union, the legal services of the Council of the European Union, simply uh, in this mixed competences uh, um, convention, decided to issue an opinion frozen the, the, the adoption by the European Union. And so this is a clear example how the European institutions, they have also to change uh, their, their mindset if they really want to help sport uh, to uh, uh, have a better uh, governance and to uh, avoid to become a fertile ground to a huge array of criminal issues that find uh, uh, sport as a, a great area to, 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 to flourish. Thanks a lot. Those were very uh, beautiful, almost poetical uh, words uh, to conclude uh, this uh, webinar where we have had a number of, uh, <clears throat> let's say, cold statistics produced with warmth and uh, great commitment. And if anyone should doubt about uh, the commitment of the panel uh, before we started, I think we have had uh, very, very strong evidence that the three of you are uh, strongly committed uh, to improving uh, the sp sports environment. And I must say personally, I feel very grateful that we can uh, count uh, with partners like you uh, in our uh, debates. Um, it, it, when I started, I said we were almost terrified by the number uh, that had registered more than 350 uh, people. Uh, I'm now a little more calm because many stayed away and just made the registration because it was free but we had around around 100 and fee, uh, 150 
people who were that were constant audience of 150 some were coming some were going but i think still it's a very very satisfying number and it's very encouraging to know that there are so many people out there who have really uh, committed themselves to better governance and sport when as i referred to i had the first meeting with the european commission uh, some 10 years ago, where they we, we were sort of how to approach this issue of governance, I think nobody would expect that this would be uh, come such a dominant uh, theme and engage so many people. So I would like to, to thank you all uh, those who listened patiently. I hope you have also enjoyed the day. Now, it was my impression to say that if this was an Oprah Winfrey show, you should all have looked under your chairs now uh, or rather in the chat, uh, because there is actually a very good free book uh, on governance coming out. But uh, Arnold and, and partly Stannis have uh, stolen this uh, um, impact because, uh, and, and they are really entitled to, I must say, uh, because we already have links to that book. Um, <clears throat> it's called Good Governance and Sport Critical Reflections, and it's a free book published by Routledge, uh, thanks to uh, uh, a donation from Utrecht University, where Arnold and uh, Frank van Ekeren, who are the editors of this book, uh, are employed. Uh, I think you will find it a very, very important resource. And if you cannot find the link um, in the uh, in the chat, uh, I'm sure we'll find ways to communicate it. We will sure, uh, very soon have articles uh, about the book on our website. So. Uh, I can uh, highly recommend that uh, that you uh, take a look at, at that book, uh, read uh, one of various or all chapters. Um, last but not least, this was an online event. If you all register when we open the registration for Play the Game 2022, then we will already have a good group of uh, people uh, gathered. We will celebrate our uh, 25 years as a conference uh, from 27th to 30 June in Odense in the middle of Denmark with good connections to the airport. Odense is um, the native town of Hans Christian Andersen. And, and you may say that uh, play the game has maybe been an ugly duckling. We will see whether it will ever become a swan, but it will uh, uh, for sure. Uh, the conference will be uh, a forum for storytelling uh, as we have uh, been throughout the 25 years. With that inspiration from Hans Christian Andersen, I think we, we look forward uh, to another exciting uh, conference. And may I also add, the conference is back to back with the stage uh, of Tour de France. Uh, very because uh, Tour de France has, France has somehow expanded its ter ter territory uh, to Denmark uh, for a week or so, three stages uh, uh, at the end of June and beginning of July, and the the riders will arrive almost next to the hotel, give or take some 25 kilometers, uh, and there is also a very big European or rather Danish uh, sports. Uh, grassroots sports festival, uh, which takes place uh, some 30 kilometers uh, from the hotel and where we will get one free day pass uh, to everyone who wish to enjoy that very colorful atmosphere where 25 to 30,000 people will be gathered just to have fun with sports. So this was a little uh, advertising uh, which uh, uh, caused a delay uh, in the program, but we will soon uh, publish our call for papers in case you want to to speak at the conference, please send in your uh, your abstract or your idea or your storyline, uh, and we will also uh, probably in, in at the beginning of the new year open registration. Uh, prices will be the same as in previous conferences. They are, uh, if you ask us, they are very fair prices, who who uh, mostly cover uh, eating and drinking at the conference. So, with these words, I'd like to thank you all. We were incredibly uh, encouraged by the great interest shown in the uh, National Sports Governance Observer Round 2. I would like to thank once again the panel, the speakers today, 
all the researchers, Sandy Adam and uh, Christina Frisch Johansen and uh, other colleagues for uh, the hard work over the past weeks, months and years. Thank you very much and have a very good Tuesday evening. Thank <laughs> you.